2,513 day of continuous webinar conducted by International Forum for Promoting Homeopathy. Today, our guest is Dr. Najib Ahmad. Let us begin the session with one minute silent Hello. prayer. Thank you all. As you all know, the International Forum for Promoting Homeopathy comprises of homeopathic lovers, students, and homeopathic doctors, and we have three sessions every day. The first session of the day is already over in Hindi, and that to, uh, uh, from uh, 7.30 to 8.30, and from 8.30 to 9.30, we have international session in English, and 9.30 to 10.30, local language session in Malayalam. And uh, uh, all the sessions are going in a good way and we are uploading in the videos of the presentation every on the very next day itself so that those who miss the same can uh, watch again and again and you can you may be uh, su uh, subscribe the same and you can uh, share it with your friends as well as homeopathy lovers too so that homeopathy will reach every home around the world and this is the purpose of international forum for promoting homeopathy we have discussed uh, many subjects in this forum and today we have a very good uh, guest in dr najib ahmad uh, doctor has presented uh, some two to three sessions in our forum in english session and uh, doctor has completed bhms then ifm then finem and mba in HCS. And so these are the qualifications of the presenter. Uh, he, he is really an international presenter and then he is a person who always uh, present different subjects in a different part uh, of, uh, of the world also. Uh, so he is well known for his uh, 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 beautiful uh, vocabulary and speaking language, all these uh, things, connecting everything with the health. So uh, we can proudly welcome our guest of the day uh, for uh, today. The subject, as you know, it is a different one. Uh, it's a very, very good one also. A holistic approach to body composition and well-being. This is something to be watched. And let us proudly welcome the guest of the day, Dr. Najib. Welcome, Dr. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dhanesh. I hope uh, I'm audible. Uh, yes. yes. Oh, wonderful. So you can see me as well. So thank you so much for the very liberal and uh, wonderful uh, introduction. And thank you so much again for inviting me to present a topic in this auspicious platform, in this very coveted platform. And uh, I congratulate the uh, you and all the leaders who are working behind this wonderful idea of promoting homeopathy through online. So thank you once, once again. My topic today is... Uh, about uh, uh, the body composition and its importance. I would like to present uh, a presentation uh, uh, to, to make it more easier and more focused. Uh, so can you see my presentation here? And uh, please upload once again, we cannot see it. Yes. Please, Please stop sharing and then reshare it. Yes. Okay, okay. I need to do that once. Share. Okay, now, now it's visible. Now it is visible? Yes, yes. No, not this, not this. Not this. I need to stop sharing. Then share again. Yes, yes, yes. This is the one. Share. Okay. Then view slideshow. Great. Wonderful. Now we can see the presentation, I hope. Yes, yes. So uh, thank you once again. Our topic of the day is uh, shaping your health, a holistic approach to body composition and well-being. So we are uh, in a dynamic world where people are coming with us various knowledge, various understanding, our understanding about the human body is evolving and changing. New paradigms and new disciplines are coming in. And being a holistic approach, homeopathy has been a forerunner in, in many of these new developments in so many you know, decades, per to say. And uh, uh, the world is moving more into the holistic part, the modern system, more and more uh, 
understanding about the medicine and uh, various approach in the medicine is uh, substantiating our stand as a holistic system but have we have been you know holding since long since you know 200 years so that is something which i want to share you in the beginning so let me just start my presentation there will be two or three sessions all together under this uh, uh, topic yeah. and today That's we are going to uh, doctor it is too small uh, the screen is too small uh, we don't know how to we can we can, uh, we can see uh, you in two sessions okay uh, uh, now it's now it's good okay okay so now it is, you can see the entire screen right yeah. learning object learning uh, objective uh, there will be a, a classification of uh, uh, the the concept of uh, body composition classification in various ways like uh, according to the location according to type according to the functionalities so the the brick by brick uh, uh, classification will be followed we try to understand in that way in the very in, in the first session today why body composition is so important and we'll try to understand effective methods to measure various technologies various devices which we can utilize in understanding uh, body composition and another thing is recognizing factors that influence body composition. What are the different various factors which are uh, going to affect various composition of the body, various body uh, uh, you know, uh, factors which is going to affect the body's uh, you know, uh, comp comp compositions. So that will be the major topics we are going to discuss today. Why body composition is so important? We, we are into a new age, many new uh, ideas are coming in and uh, we are getting bombarded by even by our patients uh, with various new questions which we haven't seen in the past. So we need to understand wh what is body composition. Let us ask this question to a boy, a boy whose name is Frank, his age is uh, uh, 10 years, while he was still a very young boy, he lost his, he, his father abandoned him and his mother. And uh, he was under his, under the shadow of his mother. His mother was everything for him. And he was his color, he was his dream, she was his dream, she was his wings. And, and he, when he was 10, he lost his mother in a fine, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a very disastrous day. So he lost his mother and he, he lost everything. And the day he lost his mother, he started to hate something called death. Because death is what he, was that thing that took away, snatched away his mother from him. So he grew up uh, suffering all the organs of motherlessness, all the bitterness of that, that that particular death has caused in his life. And he has developed a peculiar hatred, a peculiar distaste towards the idea of death. Everything he heard about, every every time he hears about death, his body, you know, show all the you know tensions and strains and you know kind of uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, bad emotions. So he has developed a peculiar problem called denethophobia or fear of death or hatred of death. So he had a dream. He thought of a world where there is no disease, so there is no death. And a, a, a world he can find a cure, a world he can defeat death. So best thing he can do for finding a solution to do for death is to become a doctor. So he tried to become a doctor. He learned, he tried for him to be, and he became a doctor. Being a doctor, he became name, he, he uh, earned the name and fame and he started curing many diseases. And he started curing many, many diseases, but there was one thing which he could not cure. There was one thing which he wanted to cure for most. He wanted to cure that particular thing like anything else and most important than anything else, but he could not cure that disease. That was the disease called death. Everything he, he, he could cure. And he started to explore he started to do all the researches all the every time day in the day out he started to have an ambition a monstrous ambition a cure for death 
he thought of creating new life, bringing life from dead or bringing dead back to life. That was his ambition. He started working on it. He started to collect various body parts. He started to you know, understand body's chemicals, body's dynamics, body's energy patterns. He tried to learn a lot about the body's you know, compositions and compoundings. And he tried to, he, he ventured, he explored various tombs to find best body parts available. He went to monks and mortuaries to find best possible human uh, elements and body parts. And he collected best of the deltoid, best of the pectorals, best of the heart, best of the spleen and kidneys. And he tried various, you know, spleen and kidneys in, in, in various compositions. He tried everything and he, he finally met his success. He tried to make, he was not happy with making a human being like anything. He want to make a perfect man. He want to make a perfect human being who is resistant of all the diseases, who can defy death. That was his ambition. So he went for the best of the component, best of the body parts, best of the you know, constituents, and he tried to make a superhuman, and a superhuman far superior than all the other human beings who walked on the face of earth. And it came into being. He succeeded in his adventures. He created a human being, an artificial human being, so big, so strong, so monstrous, so huge. But he realized something, something, uh, fishy, something messy. And uh, when the bees came into life, he realized his mistake. Everything was there. There was massive, uh, you know, musculature. There was a huge head. It was all there, but there was no smile on his face, nor any expression uh, being shown by the, by the monster, by the, the beast he has created. So he tried many things, but he could not succeed in that. And the monster, he, the, 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 the best of the part he has created, the best of the ingredient, the end result was something monstrous, something very gruesome. And he decided to put the, the creature, the creature under a cell, under the custody without letting him to, you know, to public places. And the creature and the beast was under custody in a cell, bored and alone, he tried various ways. And finally, monster managed to escape the prison. He was bored, he was alone, he was... Uh, and the creature ventured out looking for some fun, some company, some making some friends, making some companions. He, he met people out in the street. He tried to impress people, uh, but he ended up only to make them terrified, only to make them more agitated and, and, and uh, fearsome. So all of them are... Uh, you know, afraid of him, they started to flee and they started to, uh, you know, agitate. They started to throw pell things from the balcony, from behind the walls. They started to throw everything against him. They, they, they tried to injure him. So dejected, rejected, and being hurt, he turns away from the crowd. He lost his hope. He could not uh, make a single person his friend. So he went back to his place where he was born and went back to the person who was created, to his master, the creator, and he has requested for a companion, a similar kind, a maid, who can solve his so loneliness, who can solve his uh, you know, isolation. Initially, Dr. Uh, Frankenstein agreed. Dr. Frankenstein agreed to create, uh, but... Uh, Later, he declined for the fear of creating another monster. He declined the, the request of the monster and uh, being betrayed. This betrayal further infuriated the creature. He turned into vengeance and he turned into vandalism and he ended up running into a killing spree. He started to destroy everything on the way. He started to uh, you know, kill people. He, in a rampage of killing, he could... His creator's family, one by one, the Dr. Frankenstein's fiancé, his brother, finally, uh, his lab assistant, he started to kill one and one and all. And uh, Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein, had a 
be a full, you know, had a shock and shame. He decided to destroy the beast he has created. You know, the irony here is the one who has tried to create a solution for death by creating a new form of life now has decided to kill the creation he has created as a cure for death. That is the irony. The one who do not want to see the death or killing decided to kill something that he has created. So that is the irony. So what are the lessons we can learn from this uh, a little story? And uh, we can learn something about the futility of the unrealist ambitions, the pain of social isolation. And uh, we know that uh, spare parts, the human being is, not, is something beyond the assembly of spare parts. They are wholesome, they are holistic. And best ingredient cannot make the best soup. Proposition and combination is very important. Best of the ingredient cannot give you a best, you know, best result. Balance. It is not strength. It is not big being bigger. It is not being stronger. The balance is much more important. Death cannot or should not be cured. This is another lesson we can learn from this. And pain of body shaming, pain of self-image, pain of abandonment, pain of being ridiculed is another thing. And uh, this, after the story, we know the story. And have you learned anything from the story or anything story like this? Let us ask the story to Balder, another guy, a puny, ratchetic child from Brazil, often bullied in the childhood by others due to his thin, weak body. From being a skinny drug addict, he was a skinny boy, being bullied, he turned into, you know, eventually into drug addiction. And uh, later he abandoned drugs and he has, you know, developed new, you know, uh, ambitions, new new positive uh, interest in bodybuilding, and uh, he started to create, uh, uh, you know, um, a mus musculature which is which cannot be you know dreamt of any other body you know builder. He has achieved enormous achievement in the bodybuilding, and uh, uh, from the bodybuilding, from the, the early stage, he started to you know create you know develop huge humongous biceps and chest and triceps and all those muscles he started using some a very notorious thing called uh, synthol synthol is a concoction of cc oil some painkillers pen and alcohol so it has been widely uh, misused by body you know uh, bodybuilders in many parts of parts of the world including in this uh, this arab world so he started using that and he has amassed a, a, a massive biceps and one of the biggest biceps, but he ended up having an early death at the age of 48, uh, you know, recently, some three, four months ago, he has died. And another name, this is again a boy. He was bullied in the childhood. At 16, he became a bodybuilder, same path. And he has achieved a, a level that any bodybuilder can dream of. He has become Mr. Olympia, Mr. Olympia, one of the most coveted place in the bodybuilding. From there, he again went to more ambitious, more unrealistic places. He thought of, you know, developing his biceps into 65 to 70, and he achieved 76, you know, 71 centimeter. His height was 168, and his waist was 120, his chest was 148, and again, his waist was 76. But you see his biceps, his biceps was as big as his waist. It is something incredible. And he has achieved that. How he achieved it? He started to use all those B12 injections like most of the people do. And again, he started to go to anabolic, anabolic steroids. He did that like many do. And he went to higher level of mischiefs like synthols. Synthol he started, the same synthol. And he ended up having multiple surgery on his arms shoulders and deltoids. So that is one thing. And on the flip side of, these are all happened as a response to humiliation, as a response to body shaming, as a response to being bullied. Again, there is another story of bullying. This is the other side, the flip side of the, the spectrum. These are mummified human beings of the 21st century. These are the mummies of real life, mummies who walked on the street.
These are the most famous divas in the glittering world of fashion industry. And they all have, you know, many of them, they, they you know, the, the fashion industry is obsessed, obsessed with skinniness. They're obsessed with being thin. Fashion industry give highest, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, price, highest uh, 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 amount of money to the thinnest of the diva or thinnest of the uh, uh, models. So uh, uh, the, let, let, us, let us see one of the an anoxia case. Anoxia can be something neurotic like anoxia nervosa. And in our case, it is anoxia of social origin, which is instigated by our social system like uh, tragic death of Anna Carolina, one of the very coveted, one of the highly paid uh, fashion model, and uh, one of the most famous uh, name brand in the fashion industry. When she was having only 19, this is one of the best, you know, uh, BMI, body mass, body mass index. She was 19 or 18.5. The brand said, you are, you are overweight. You should not be 19. You should bring your body further. She, she started to venture on anorexia. She started venture on eating less and less and less. She obsessed with thinning on, thinning, being rejected by the fashion industry, being rejected by the fashion brand, that particular fashion brand. She started, uh, you know, abandoning all, his, all her food and water. She went from 19 to 14. She became thin, thin and thin. And she became 14 and she had an early death. Uh, due to this particular thing. Again, uh, we know the story of elite athlete is not any different. We know the recent story. The story we all had, we, all of us made so shattered, so, so, you know, uh, painful for most of us. That extra 100 grams that shattered the dreams of thousand million people of the subcontinent. You know, Vinesh Fogat. She lost her uh, title and qualification being contested on the finals for 100 grams. This is what it is. The importance of our body composition is so, so supreme, so important. She was actually, why did she lost? She was originally, she was 57 of the ring weight. That is her normal weight when she is not contesting. And when he, she contests, usually contested in 53, she compelled to this time and during during 2018, she was compelled to contest on 50 kg, much lesser than her original body weight. And she had three bouts of matches on the same day. The day she she was disqualified. One of the match she uh, and a conquered. She defeated uh, a Japanese uh, uh, Japanese champion Yui Saki, uh, who had had a long string of you know, undefeated uh, 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 career and uh, uh, Vinesh uh, defeated her the same day. And she ended up having 2.7 kg overweight in the same, same day. You know, what happens is when somebody is doing strenuous exercise, long hours of, you know, muscle uh, taxation, there will be muscle rupture, there will be, uh, you know, a lot of um, inflammatory changes. With this inflammatory changes, body will try to push a lot of nutrients. Body will try to push a lot of, uh, you know, water, a lot of uh, nutrients to the body, to the muscle tissues where the injury has been uh, occurred. There will be, uh, you know, a lot of repair and recovery changes, you know, uh, uh, activities are happening. So that will build up a kind of fluid, a build up kind of nutrients. So, you know, in, in, a, in, in, in hours, the athlete will gain some weight after a strong strenuous exercise, a strong match, a strong wrestling you know, bout. So she had developed after three long you know, matches, she bout, she ended up having 2.7. So there is a super shredding uh, challenge of 2.7 kg in 10 hours. So haircut, sauna, treadmill. So, so they tried everything, they tried everything. So no water no blood letting and a lot of sauna you know they have they they even tried blood blood tank. they tried to you know remove blood out of us out of her veins to to
no water, no, you know, uh, treadmill, sauna, haircut. So they they even tried to remove blood out of her body. Despite all those measures, she lost her qualification for 100 grams. So this is something which is, which elite athletes are, you know, living. This is the challenges most of them are facing. So this is what it is. So, uh, so risk of weight cutting. What are the risk of drastic weight, weight, you know, weight cutting? Before we go into our part of the presentation, we need to know what, how much, you know, challenging it is. Even we need to understand the risk of drastic weight management. We often go with various weight management pro regimen programs. So there can be a lot of inflammation. There can be a lot of, you know, rebound weight gain can be there. Eating disorder can be there. And hormonal imbalance is another very important thing. And it can lead you to osteoporosis and protein energy malnutrition, recurrent infections, and a lot of immunity challenges. And it can even cause cardiovascular diseases. There are two, you know, very dis uh, discussed uh, cases of, uh, uh, you know, drastic weight cutting. Uh, Uria Hall was one of the athletes who had mini seizures and she had a heart attack. Again, Yin Yang, a Chinese athlete, died of uh, 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 dehydration and, you know, uh, while she was on weight cutting. And uh, again, uh, you know, female athletes or female in general are uh, having a greater risk of you know, weight cutting. And body type, again, this exotype of, or endomorphs and exomorphs, we will discuss about endomorphs and exomorphs later, uh, will be having uh, more uh, challenges in weight cutting. We will understand why it is. So let us uh, try to understand various somatotypes. So we will try to understand uh, different types of uh, classifications of uh, body type, somatotype, ectomorph, mesomorph, and endomorph. You know, ectomorphs are uh, more like thin, tall, and slender. And there can be mesomorphs, more, more muscular, more stronger, more uh, balanced. There can be endomorphs. Let, let us try to understand what these are. Ectomorphs are lean. They have a faster metabolism and uh, they have uh, some challenges in weight gaining and building muscle. Na they have narrow shoulder, they have long limbs, and they always have uh, problems in body, you know, uh, you know, kind of uh, shedding their body weights or you know, gaining, gaining their body weights. So there are some of our medicine which is which you can associate with ectomorphs. Ectomorphs thin, slender, long, like iodine. And they have a higher, faster metabolism. They have this, uh, you know, undue uh, temperature metabolism. So iodine, phosphorus, natremore are the few examples. And they, they lose their weight easily, but gaining weight is a bit challenge for them. Coming to mesomorphs, the mid, mid between ecto and endorph, they, are, they can gain muscles easily. They are athletic and strong. They have well-proportioned physics, broad shoulder, a narrow waist, and they have a better metabolism. They are the they have a, something called the uh, uh, lottery winners of the metabolic spectrum. Again, endomorphs are now the third category. They have more plumpy, flabby, softer, and rounder. They tend to uh, store fat more rapidly. They have a slower metabolism than others, and. Uh, a uh, few other examples of um, uh, the endomorphs are calcarea, graphite, kind of medicine, a lot of other medicines. And coming to the classification of, there are various classifications since beginning. And we have, we being homeopaths, we know a lot of classification in this. There are Chinese concept called the yin-yang. There is Ayurvedic concept called Vada Pitakafa. 
and Pancha Mahabuddha, like five element theory is there, which is very limit, you know, uh, similar to the body composition, Hippocratic concept of short, thin, and long and thin. Bayesian has another concept called scrofulous, gouty, and syphilitic, syphilitic, as we know the diathesis. Then Vernier and Caesar is another, uh, has postulated another carbonic, phosphoric, and fluoric constitution. Von der Gobel, very famous one, hydrogenoid, we, we heavily use in, in homeopathic literature, that is hydrogenoid, oxygen, and carbon hydrogenoid uh, constitutions. And uh, Kreshmer postulated asthenic, athletic, and uh, picnic. Pancha Mahabuddha talks about that is an ancient Indian wisdom, which is ancient, but it is still valid even in the new days, like, you know, which, which you can connect with various elemental states in a body. There is Akash, Vayu, Agni, oh, Jala, and Prithvi. And uh, this is something you can explore further. Uh, there are a lot of resources in it in internet. And Kush, Krishna's uh, uh, classification is asthenic, athletic, and uh, pyokinic, which is very much similar to the earlier one we have examined, endomorph. Asthenic are endomorphs, athletic, uh, mesomorphs are athletic, and exomorphs are exomorphs are asthenic, uh, and endomorphs are pyokinic, and athletics are mesomorphs. So again, the same medicine which is covering all this. So another type of classification, chydron, carbonitro, and oxygenoid and hydronidinoid. Coming to uh, one of the very popular, this has been a very popular uh, way of, you know, classification of body types. And even today, this has been heavily and uh, popularly used by, uh, you know, early adopters, you know, by most of the people. And uh, this will give you a broader understanding. This is, uh, this are, th there are various types in that. In the, this is called the body uh, mass index. This has been calculated by a ratio of weight over height. And uh, here we will get some ratios. One is 18.5, which is anything below 18.5, as we have seen in the case of anorexia cases, anything below 16 uh, or uh, you know 17 is anorexic, or even 18 is, is anorexic. It can, it can go even lethally low, like 14 and 15, which is dangerous, life-threatening. In uh, 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 anything below 18, it is underweight. And normally it's 18.5 to 20.9 of 25. Anything up to, that is normal, and anything up to 30 is overweight. Anything up to 35 is obese. And anything beyond that, anything over 35, and 40, 45, that is, it can be extremely obese, obese type one, obese type two, obese type three, there are multiple obese classification against this, again is there. So though BMI is highly popular, it is a very broad, a very narrow, so very broad kind of classification, which will not give you finer understanding of your body challenges. And it can give you, if, if you are an athlete, if you are somebody who is tall and very firm, even uh, you have um, a bad body, you know, BMI, you may be still a heavy, you know, a healthy person because this is a rough estimate. Even if you are having same people who are, who are, who are having 23 body BMI, one can be highly, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, unhealthy and other can be, very healthy because this is not an absolute parameter of understanding bodybuilding because even Mike Tyson or, or some bodybuilders, they can be 26, 27, but they have a huge musculature and they can they will be having a very good metabolism unless they go beyond something, some, some, some other limits. So BMI is not everything. You can have uh, same BMI with different states of health. So we need, we need to go beyond BMI. So there are new ways of looking into things that is we call body composition in finer ways, in more details. So what is body composition? Body composition refers to the proportion of various elements in your body in terms of uh, lean mass, in terms of uh, fat mass. There are two, cat no, two compartment cat classification, three compartment, four compartment classification. 
you can explore all these various compartment classification. There are a lot of literature available online. So when we go into two compartment classification, which is broadly classified into fat mass classification, non-fat, fat mass and non-fat mass components. So coming into uh, for four, you know, compartment, there will be muscle tissue, there will be essential fat, there will be non-essential fat, there will be bone marrow, there will be others. So there are multiple, sorry. There will be multiple uh, 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 classification like non-essential fat, bone and protein. So these are the derivatives of you know, non-fat uh, uh, fat mass or lean mass. So these are the, we'll try to understand brick by brick uh, or component by component understanding. So muscle tissue, usually it should be more than 36 or four. Best is around 40. And essential fat should be around 12, 12 to 15 or 16. It varies male to female, of course, and various athletic challenges, various job challenges, various career can vary. Non-essential fat, again, 15%. Bone mass can be 12. These are the broad way of looking at it that we will into. We will look into brick by brick picture of body composition in the coming uh, uh, slide. That there will be total body weight now. And total body weight will be classified under fat mass and non-fat. And fat can be essential and non-essential. And fat free can be lean, uh, dry mass, or toddy, dry mass and wet mass. Wet mass is total body weight body water uh, and, and coming under the dry mass we will be having bone mineral components or composition and non-bone mineral compositions and under water we will be having extracellular water intracellular water and we'll be having soft tissue in soft tissue we'll be having smm and non-smm we'll come into that later so coming again into fat mass there will be essential fat and storage fat this is very important we need to understand the difference between essential and st storage fat and again, another type of classification can be subcute fat and visceral fat. Depends upon the location of the fat. And uh, healthy fat percent percentage can be vary according to the age, according to the gender, sex, male or female, or various different kind of, you know, or in the weather, for example, this can vary. And lean mass can be of muscles, of bone mass, it can be water, it can be connective tissue, and coming into fat mass, do we need to take a break and to to clarify any of the points so far? Dr. Dinesh? Yes, uh, uh, if, if somebody, if anyone, uh, that we can go on the later part. To the end, right? To the yes. end, of course. Wonderful. Okay. So, so there can be fat mass, essential fat and non-essential fat or storage fat. Essential fat can be like, you know, the essential fat which we need to get from the food. Okay, and body cannot create that. And body function, it, it is important for uh, communication, it can be important for, for uh, hormone production, structure of the cells, structure of the cell wall, uh, mitochondria, nucleus, neurons, and energy supply. It has a lot of job. Essential fat is so important for us. Storage fat is something which is coming in excess. Okay, it can be an energy resource, of course, it can be a source of diseases as well. There is another kind of classification which is called white fat and brown fat. White fat is the most, most of the storage fat and the brown fat is most of the functional fat which, which is helping us to produce more uh, energy. Brown fat is full of mitochondria. It has a lot of mit mitochondria in it than white fat, the normal fat. So why mitochondria is so brown? Because it has a lot of energy, you know, iron in it. So this is how it is. So coming into fat mass, coming into fat mass, it can be uh, in various locations like subco uh, subcutaneous, uh, uh, you know, location. It can be in in in, your, in, your, in intraabdominal or visceral fat, which is a dangerous one, though it is not always dangerous. It has a lot of job in there. Visceral fat beyond some level is dangerous. It is not always dangerous. Subcutis, again, it has some job beyond some level. It is, it is not a good thing. So again, we have extracellular or cellular fat. Something about extracellular, it is called extracellular vesicle fats, which 
late, recently we have a lot of information of that, a lot of health benefits, a lot of and a positive thing about extracellular. It, it, it's, a, it's, it's a signaling molecule. It will tell a lot about your health by understanding its various components, further components of EVs or extracellular fats. Coming to brown fat, which is a good fat, or mitochondria rich fat, how we can improve it, how we can uh, just, we will re reset it and we'll go to further, okay? There are a few things which we can improve by, by doing uh, something called, you know, thermoregulation or cold bathing, in, you know, going into a, a, a ch kind of challenge of calling. It will help us to create a hormes hormetic changes in our body, which will trigger the production of more, more mitochondria in your cells, more linking of mitochondria, more production of iron, more mobilization of iron and mitochondrial uh, population in your cells. Then another thing in, we can improve, increase our iron intake, like spinach and like liver, like you know, organ for this, a lot of other things, like legumes. We can uh, we have a lot of good resources for iron uh, supplements, iron supply in our food. Then again, balanced diet is very important, which is not agonist against ions. There are a lot of things which can kill ion in your food. Again, exercise is another huge thing we can do uh, 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 to improve the mitochondrial population of cells. Uh, exercise can again, again trigger hormesis, again trigger a lot of um, you know, biomolecular changes in your body. And uh, coming into the various ratios of fire, fat mass in our body, based on age, we can have uh, uh, eight to 19, coming to men's, it is eight to 19, during the below 14 years, under 60, it should be, uh, it can go like 11 to 21, it can go a bit higher. And again, 76, we will be having a lot of mice, you know, sarcopenia, muscle will be less, eventually fat will be more. Again, we can go up to 24 being male, male will be having a lesser one. Female can have a little more normally, a little more fat than male. And for them to, below 40, it can be up to 32. And below 60, it can be up to 33. And below 76, it can be uh, up to 35. And again, body fat percentage to a chart, somebody who is underweight will be having around 8% of the total body fat. A normal one can have a 12 percentage. And uh, overweight can have 15, 16 percentage. Somebody who is having a 25 percent of body fat means he is little too much. When we measure, when we be using all those devices to measure, you will see this, and you you will see this red flag of 25. You see, you see that there is this is not a good uh, thing to go on to, uh, to 25. And 30 is a bit too much. It is extreme obesity. Uh, 30 having 35, the 30 percentage or 35 percentage. So coming into lean mass, lean mass includes muscles, bones, as we have mentioned earlier. Muscles can be like skeletal muscle mass and non-skeletal muscle mass. We can have skeletal muscles like all those big muscles and we can have muscles in other parts. The organ muscles can be there, sphincter muscles can be there. So a lot of other muscles are there. So again, bone, is another area we can we can have lean muscle we can include in lean muscles. Water is another most important thing in lean muscle. We can have intracellular, extracellular water, connective tissue is another area like tendons, like you know cartilages, ligaments, and 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 a lot of you know, and mo mo most intracellular, uh, extracellular um, uh, tissues and organ uh, tissues and uh, 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 things. Organs like lung, liver, flat, and kidneys, and a lot of other organs, which can be coming under uh, lean muscles, uh, lean uh, body mass. And lean muscles, lean mass can be axial and apiticular. Depends upon its distribution. We can have uh, lean, this is very important in, in, in application. Axial muscle, you know, uh, lean muscles and lean body fat, oh, sorry, uh, uh, axial uh, lean mass can be uh, around most of the body organs and abdominal muscles can be there. But most of the pectoral, pelvic, girdle, and appendicular muscles are coming under appendicular extent. muscles. This is very important. Having a lot of lean mass in, in 
appendicular area in our peripheral distribution. That means strong arms and strong legs is, is, has a lot of meaning in metabolism. There's a lot of meaning in metabolism. So this is very important. So a higher proportion of lean mat, lean mass is very important for optimal health. And a lower percentage of fat mass is very important. A lower percentage of fat mass is important in, in maintaining our health. And a higher percentage, likewise, is important in maintaining health. So this is, this is, there is a reciprocal uh, you know, relation between these two. So what are the benefits if you have, if you have more lean mass? There will be small muscles, stronger muscles. Our functional uh, capacity will be more, will be more uh, capability in doing our various daily course. We'll be having stronger muscles. We'll be having uh, more con confidence in our day-to-day -day activities. Again, that is that is a physical manifestation. Internally, the metabolic rate, metabolism, sugar metabolism, insulin metabolism, and inflammation management, and a lot of various other things. So the lean muscles, like especially muscle mass, lean mass in general, have a lot of meaning, a lot of importance in that. Reduced risk in chronic diseases. Inflammation in general will contribute to chronic diseases, like cardiovascular diseases various metabolic diseases, diabetes and freedom of diabetes, thyroid diseases, kidney diseases, end-stage renal diseases, a lot of inflammatory, you know, chronic diseases are linked to the inflammatory process, which is in turn linked to a compromised lean, muscle, lean body mass. And it can help us to prevent injuries. It can give us better mobility. And at the end of the day, there is a big parameters in aging. When we try to understand aging, we'll look into all these body factors. Whether you have an optimal level of protein, whether you have you know, optimal level of uh, uh, your body, you know, muscle mass, your bone density, your uh, water content, all these are the parameters which will help us to understand body age. So if you have all these in good you know, ratios, you have a very good age a very good body, a very good metabolic health. It is not the chronological, chronological age that is that matters. It is your metabolic that matters most. So healthy aging, it has a lot of importance. So this is one thing we can use in our uh, you know, clinical practice when we try to understand the ratios. When, when we try to understand, evaluate various body, we'll be, we'll be using a lot of body composition tools. We'll come to, into that later. Where we need to look, how we need to figure out. These are called CID, C shape, I shape, and D shape. You can see that in that picture. C is cautious. You need to be very, you know, cautious in that because that is not a good picture. Weight is important, you know, higher than skeletal muscle mass. Body fat is much more important than skeletal muscle mass. So you will get a C curve. This C curve is a very bad curve. And um, ideal one is ideal one. It is good. It is better if you have an I curve. I curve is ideal. It's okay, and in that you will be having a balanced weight, moderate muscle mass, and moderate body fat. The best, a well developed one, a beautiful one, a better, a stronger one is if you have a D curve. D curve, you will be having a stronger muscle mass and a less fatty body fat. This is the most you know, important and most uh, uh, sought after. We need to we need to achieve that as much as possible. That is the CID classification. Why body composition is so important? Because uh, if we try to understand the various risk of health, we need to understand body composition. Because if we have excessive stored fat, it it poses a lot of challenges in our health. And if you have a better muscle mass, it will, it will give you an understanding that you have a better health. Metabolically, you have better, better you know, life expectancy, better, you know, uh, a lesser risk for chronic diseases, a lesser risk for cardiometabolic diseases. So that is, that will give us an understanding about health risk. Again, it will give us a realistic fitness. We are working on fitness. We are trying to understand and improve our health. So how we can understand whether we are going to the right path. 
how we can track it. We, th this is very important. It is not by physically looking into our various, you know, uh, chemical tests. It, it, the, 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 you know, there is no very accurate, you know, test we can understand uh, where we can uh, learn about our physical fitness than this body composition. Uh, so body composition gives us a lot of clue. If our fitness work is improper, we will see a better water content. We will, we will see more muscle mass. When you have more muscle mass, your body will start to retain more water. And your when you have more water, your uh, hormonal balance will be optimized and stabilized. Your uh, various uh, uh, protein metabolism will be uh, enhanced. Once your protein is in a better shape, your mitochondrial activity, your genomic expression will be better and better because protein's nature is important in defining your genomic expression. Once your genome is good, your entire health is good. So again, optimizing nutrition is another thing. If you know, if you have a very clear understanding about various uh, components of our uh, body composition, you can work on your health, you know, you, you, your nutrition better. You can mobile, you, you can play with various nutritional component. You can add more iron. You can add more, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. mitochondrial boosting, you know, food. You can uh, control. Doctor, doctor how many how many slates remaining? I think we have another four or five only in this because we will be having, yeah, only four, only three or maybe, maybe three. We can oh. conclude in that. Okay. So we are, uh, uh, yeah, we have another five, ten, five, six minutes. Okay. Let me just, yeah, go, uh, you know, into a couple of slides. Or uh, you can put those slides in the next presentation as well. Let me complete this slide. Okay. Because um, we can discuss. Uh, whatever we have discussed, uh, you know, we have uh, covered so far. Then uh, tailoring personalized exercise plan. Again, body composition is important. Improving self-image, another area uh, with, with this will boost our self-confidence. So all these are uh, uh, very much important in, in optimizing our health. So understanding our body composition is so important in, in optimizing entire health activities. Uh, 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 as a responsible uh, person by ourselves, as a responsible doctor, uh, uh, clinicians, we need to help our patients in optimizing their health, optimizing their health by understanding uh, optimum body composition. Thank you so much. So we can open for uh, discussion and so people can add more value to the slides we have currently discussed. Uh, we can you can put your own wisdom if somebody want to ask something we have discussed so far we can discuss that also exactly a beautiful presentation once again uh, from dr najib it's really uh, a worthwhile presentation a different pre uh, pre pre presentation itself we never thought that uh, the last part what you told is entirely different from what we studied all these years and definitely uh, this will uh, make us a uh, better uh, thinkers in that line also. I invite all uh, participants to join for the discussion and you can ask your doubt. Anyways, congratulations once again, uh, Dr. Najib. I invite uh, Dr. Jose Sikhsar to uh, begin the session. Uh, uh, sir, uh, Jose Sikhsar, that was there. Uh, sir, something. Ambadi, doctor, do you want to say anything more on the subject? Dr. Emadevi Ambadi? Uh, doctor, if you are available, we can uh, continue the session on 26th. Are you Available. Fine. Yeah, 22nd, 26th. Uh, I will confirm, reconfirm. I need to check my appointments. Okay. Uh, that, that, probably yeah. I can do, but I can reschedule some of the appointments. I okay. will confirm. I will reconfirm it once I check it. No. 26th will be fine, I think. You told about the different uh, aspect of uh, this uh, 
uh, see, uh, uh, constitutions also. Yes, yes, yes. That's so we I'm are enlightened. Actually, homeopathy, the beauty of homeopathy is these are all new for most of the other disciplines like allopaths. You know, most of the functional medicine allopaths are now started learning all these. Constitution, temperaments, they are started learning all this, but we are enlightened with all this. But how much we are using it in our clinical practice? This is are we utilizing this wisdom? Are we are you aware of new developments, new uh, you know, understanding about all this ball decomposition, all these devices we can utilize in our clinical practice? Next presentation, we will be focusing more on practical areas of this body composition. This was a bit of theoretical, a bit of philosophical, but we need to go into the practical aspect. Please. Yes, uh, Dr. Harindranwar, sir, uh, do you want to speak? And Dr. Harindranwar? No. If anyone wants to talk on this subject, you can raise your hand so that you can speak to Dr. Najib. You can ask your question to Dr. Najib also. Or just two minutes remaining. Since uh, the presentation is not completed, we can have a second session, second part of the same. And in the coming week, uh, as per doctor, doctor's convenience. Yes. That will be more interesting, more practically oriented. We can use a lot of tools in our clinical practice. And you bring, very you really brought, yes, you really brought uh, this uh, Ignace Fort into this uh, session also and how uh, uh, her body lost the weight and how she gained the weight and what are the problems that can be solved in that yes. way also. Uh, uh, yes, uh, somebody has raised the hand. Yes, let me not uh, please mention your name. You can, you can, you can speak. Somebody has raised the hand, but not now. Now I invite Dr. Maria Majon to say what a thanks to Dr. Najib here. Very nice presentation, Dr. Najib Ahmed. Uh, on behalf of IAFPs, I thank you for a such, such an informative section. Please come with another section. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. And uh, Dr. Najib, now you are at the UK? No, in, in, so in, in, in Dubai, in UAE. In the UAE. Uh, you are uh, having your discussion uh, there. Or your yes, practice. yes. Uh, yes uh, now it is your practicing time in Dubai? Yeah, now, you know, today it is not. But usually I'll be having some patients in the evening hours, of course. What is, yeah. the, uh, what is the present situation of homeopathy in Dubai? In Dubai, it is well matured, well established, and well accepted. Hope and, uh, the other GCC country will be opening to homeopathy, opening its door. And Oman, it is already there, of course. But we expect, uh, you, you know, KSA or Saudi Arabia is going to open. Now we expect soon because uh, there there are a lot of changes happening there. And again, Qatar, some movement, some some efforts are happening. I understand. So homeopathy is, uh, in a way, is is already sought after because a lot of people are there who who wants to have homeopathy in all these countries, but there was a legal you know restriction in these countries. Once it is open, the door is open. Homeopathy can flourish a lot in no time because the soil is ready. People are looking for. People are now hide and seek there trying to get some medicine they so but if it is open homeopathy can grow a lot in these countries thank you dr najib for giving such information in this uh, forum also uh, uh, tomorrow uh, tomorrow we will have a session from dr miss uh, mekha you prabhu and she will be talking about diet to improve the health and wellness so a part of the continuation of today's session also yes uh, something like that right. And she is a daughter of uh, Dr. Jayalila from Kochi. Oh. Uh, oh. Thank you, Dr. Najib. Thank and you. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much. So those who participate in the session, we can meet uh, tomorrow at the same time. With that, we end the process of the session. It's over to Dr. Maria Majon to moderate the Malayalam session. <laughs>